It's a daunting challenge that only the bravest of the brave would attempt. After accepting a dare from fellow Tory diners, David David sauntered along the crumbling ramparts of Saltwood Castle. One false move would have meant a sheer drop from the black route in front of his host, the late Alan Clark. Nonchalantly completing the black route cemented David Davis's reputation as a fearless hard man. It also showed that he's prepared to take risks, but never in a reckless way. And that shows the approach he will take to the Brexit negotiations. He takes pride in his ability to take risks, but only after making a very careful assessment of all the options in front of him. In David Davis's mind, the Black Route was a walk in the park compared with the demands of one of his proudest achievements, a stint in the SAS reserves. When it came to funding his way through university, he did it by joining the military. He became a, a, a member of the Special Air Service, uh, the, the, the Territorial Army Regiment, which as one wag once said, it means that he knows how to kill people, but only at weekends. He won the respect of his military comrades after a deprived and troubled upbringing in South London. One night, um, we got to bed absolutely shattered in the barrack block uh, from uh, a, 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 an endurance march. And we got, went, got to bed at midnight. At four o'clock in the morning, suddenly, there were shouts and yells. The lights came on. Everybody out, on parade, under pants only, get on the track. Uh, the last man to the top of the Brecon Beacons and back will fail. Uh, that's pretty standard stuff coming from the instructors. But on this occasion, it was David doing the shouting. Are you going to accept the status quo? Are you going to accept cap in hand capitalism? Although he'd been interested in politics since his student days, David Davis embarked on a business career spanning two decades after leaving university. He ended up on the board of Tate and Lyle, a suitable position for a sugar addict. Four scoops in his tea on a good day. After entering Parliament at the age of 38 in 1987, his business and military background provided the perfect training for the assignment that made his name as a senior whip pushing through the Maastricht Treaty. David Davis may have been the enforcer of the integrationist EU treaty, but he was no starry-eyed pro-European as a former colleague can attest. His first contact with Europe was as a businessman with Tate and Lyle and what the common agricultural policy did was essentially disadvantage it for the benefit of French sugar beet growers and so what David saw was a very distorted policy which hurt British interests, seemed commercially foolish, wasteful of money um, and which was anti-British. Uh, I think that affected his uh, uh, initial uh, uh, judgment about Europe. So David Davis's colleagues say there should be no surprise that the enforcer of Maastricht is now the man guiding the UK out of the EU. Maastricht was a long time ago. The European Union has become much more integrationist since then and um, the flaws, I think, in the project have become much more apparent. David Davis hoped to replace Michael Howard as Tory leader in 2005, but a less than scintillating speech to the Tory conference paved the way for the next generation. Friends admitted this failure highlighted some character flaws. He works incredibly hard, but he always likes to take August off. <laughs> and the trouble was that he needed to use August to tell the country why he wanted to be prime minister back in 2005. David Cameron kept his rival on as Shadow Home Secretary, but David Davis never felt entirely comfortable and ended his front bench career when he triggered a by-election, which he won, on a point of principle, on civil liberties. Cameron regarded this as a vain act of folly. He's, he, he's an extraordinarily optimistic and self-confident person. I remember uh, one of the Cameroons uh, once uh, saying to me in exasperation, that uh, he's uh, the only person he knows who didn't go to Eton but has the same level of self-confidence you get from an Eton education. And I gleefully retail this to David, who hooted with laughter. There followed nearly a decade as a serial troublemaker 
on the back benches. There's a, there's a sort of Churchill element to the journey, isn't there? He hasn't actually changed parties, but, but he has been in the wilderness. He's had his wilderness years. I think he is a very unusual politician, uh, a, a man of great principle, as we see, a man prepared to go into the wilderness, um, but also a man who reinvents himself and comes back. At the time of the EU referendum, David Davis had an inkling that he might be called up by a desperate David Cameron if he'd stayed on as Prime Minister after losing. So David Davis campaigned on the Leave side, though in a low-key way. I remember on the night of the referendum, I was at ITV, uh, and I can remember, I was actually with Liam Fox in the studio with Tom Bradby about to do an interview, when it was kind of officially declared, that's it, there's no way that Remain can now win. And Fox looked stunned, and then we left the studio after doing, doing the interview and walked out, and David Davis was there, and he just went up to Liam Fox and said, we've done it. And he looked like he was really kind of celebrating. The call did come, but from a new number 10, whilst he was catching up with an old colleague. He listened to his voice message. He then said, oh, uh, looks like uh, number 10 wants to see me. So off he went up Downing Street and I went to the pub and watched him walk up the street from the screen. Uh, and the next thing I know, uh, he's standing out the front and we're going for a pizza. So um, it was um, a completely ordinary evening with something slightly extraordinary happening in the middle of it. Theresa May took a bit of a gamble in appointing David Davis. In the past, they've clashed on civil liberties and they're not exactly natural political soulmates. But David Davis has won the trust of the Prime Minister. The word in number 10 is that he's coming into his own on Brexit and he's even turning into something of an elder statesman. No such praise for his fellow Brexiteers, Boris Johnson and Liam Fox. Just down the street in his office in number nine, David Davis puts his success down to two factors, silence and what he calls proximity. He's avoided talking out of line and he's ensured that by squatting in the building next door, he can saunter into number 10 if any problems arise. As a priority, we will pursue a bold and ambitious free trade agreement with the European Union. The extent of David Davis's influence was shown when the Prime Minister set out her overall negotiating approach in a speech in Lancaster House earlier this year. Theresa May said she was prepared to walk away from a bad deal. With his belief in taking risks but never acting recklessly, David Davis had told the Prime Minister the EU will only take the UK seriously if it shows it is unafraid of no deal. Obviously, it would be better both for the European Union and for the UK if a sensible, constructive deal is struck. But if, for whatever reason, they don't want to do that, we'll be fine um, without a deal. We can manage without a deal. Better with one, but fine without one. David Davis knows such a path would be fraught with danger. A marked change from his tone during the referendum campaign, when he appeared to suggest Brexit would be straightforward. His EU counterpart, Michel Barnier, believes British talk of a walkout is a bluff. I think the British government, everyone in the British government, know uh, that um, a non-deal is going to be a simple catastrophe. So, you know, if you want to walk out of the negotiations, you better have good negotiating cards, and, and Britain doesn't. So, so in that sense, I, I hope that we never get into that state. The former Finnish Prime Minister advises David Davis that Michel Barnier will expect him to agree early on to the principles, though not the exact sum, of a financial exit bill. The landing zone for this negotiation is that you come up with the principles of the finances in the beginning, you see what the bill is then at the end of the day, and then you start the negotiations at the same time on Britain's new relationship with the UK. But my fear is that in these negotiations, because there's so many vested interests, you're going to have a clash, and you're going to have a few of those clashes right in the beginning. Alex Stubb also suggests it would be wise for David Davis to rebuild the personal rapport he established with Michel Barnier when they were fellow Europe ministers in the 1990s. I think they should go for quite a few glasses of wine and quite a few glasses of pints, just the two of them to sort things out. 
The tough path of leaving the EU will finally be underway in the last week of March when Theresa May triggers Article 50. That is a bit of a blow to David Davis, who had hoped to move this week. But the ever-confident Brexit secretary carries on serenely. He's the only man I know who can swagger sitting down, one Tory grandee says. <laughs>